Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Most of you all will remember that in 2018, this General Assembly passed a very sweeping reform of child welfare legislation in House Bill 1. And since that time, I've continued to say that we did a lot then, but we haven't done enough. We need to go further. And that's what Senate Bill 8 does. The Senator from, from Jefferson has done an excellent job with this bill. And Senate Bill 8 has been designed in a manner that should unite all of us. It incorporates input from the Attorney General's Office, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, the Administrative Office of the Courts, Child Welfare Provider, Advocates, and our foster youth. I'll go through this as quickly as possible, section by section. Uh, the sections one through nine amend the various sections of KRS Chapter 15 to expand the scope, memberships, and function of the Child Sexual Abuse and Exploitation Prevention Board to include all forms of child abuse and neglect, including sexual abuse and exploitation. This board will now become the Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Board. It will be comprised of leaders in child welfare from across the state and be focused on the welfare of children in the Commonwealth. Section 10 clarifies that the Cabinet is responsible for administering child welfare programs that promote collaboration and accountability among government agencies and public and private programs. The amendment of this section is intended to promote collaboration with community partners and other organizations such as that Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Board previously mentioned. Section 11 expands the definition of fictive kin to include an individual who is emotionally significant, has an emotionally significant relationship with a biological parent, sibling, or half-sibling in the case of a child from birth to one year of age. This was a gray area in fictive kin, and she's done a good job of establishing that someone must have had a personal relationship with someone in the family before that child will be granted to them in the fictive kin case. Section 12 clarify that the cabinet has five business days to submit an affidavit verifying if someone is registered in the putative father, putative father registry. This amendment was suggested by KHFS. We had five days total in the bill, in House Bill 1. This extends that to five business days, which will help the cabinet out in that. Section 13 removes the ability of adoptive parents to annul an adoption based on ethnological ancestry differences in their adopted children. We saw this uh, a couple of years ago, we came across this, and we tried to do something back in 2020. Uh, it passed through this body, but didn't make it through the Senate because, of course, the pandemic hit. We had to stop at that point. So I'm glad that the lady brought this up. This should have never been in our laws. And so she is just simply striking that from the statutes. Section 14 clarifies that adoption files and records can be stored in a digital file with restricted access. This again was asked by CHFS. Section 15 expand the ability to provide family preservation services to children who are at moderate risk rather than actual risk of out of home placement. This is a huge shift in policy and practice. We have of course Kentucky being number one in abuse and neglect statistics. This is definitely going to help in that situation. And the reason for that is because about 76% of the cases across this state are based on neglect. And when you hear neglect, sometimes you think, well, these folks don't want to take care of their kids. They don't care anything about the children. But that's not always the case. Many times that's not the case. Most of the time, these people love their children. They want to take care of their children the best they can, but they lack the resources of preventative services to be able to keep them at home. And so what we're going to do is we're, we're clarifying that this will keep children at home and in their families more often. Section 16, require Medicaid reimbursement for child medical evaluations at child advocacy centers at the true and actual cost of the evaluation. This has not been updated in 20 years, and she is simply updating that those Medicaid regulations will, will adequately fund them and that those organizations are able to do those child medical evaluations. Section 17, Clarify that abuse and neglect occurs when a parent or guardian does not provide ad adequate care, supervision, clothing, sheltering, and education of a child that has financial means to do so. Again, this is going to be helping hold those children at home who are in those situations where, where poverty may be a situation and to try to pro provide those resources that they are needed. Section 18, to include that State Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Board and Health, Welfare, and Family Services Committee are on the list of entities that receive the annual report of the external child fatality and near fatality review panel. Section 19, to allow foster youth to request to extend their commitment prior to attaining 20 years of age and opt out, and opt in or opt out 
of extended commitment up to two times. This provision was developed in consultation with foster youth and former foster youth and the voices of the Commonwealth. This is in transitional care as they are transitioning out of foster youth. Uh, they have one opportunity typically at, before they reach the age of 19 right now in law to say if they are going to commit to stay in the program or not. This is giving them additional opportunities and this is somewhere our state and many states have, start, have failed our youth as they transition out. And this is going to be a focus for all of us as we go through this next year who are, who are, who are working in child welfare. This gives them more of an opportunity. This allows them to see once they get out and I will call it what I will say the real world and see whether they are able to to make it in that situation or not and if not they can opt back in and this is, this is a tremendous help to those in that transitional phase. Section 20 to add new rights to foster children as it relates to their history, case history with the cabinet, placement, connections to siblings and parenting their own children while in care. This provision was developed with consultation of foster youth again, former foster youth and the voices of the Commonwealth. Section 21 is non-codified section requiring personnel cabinet to update regulations relating to the Kentucky Employees Charitable Campaign to include the Child Victims Trust Fund. And then section 22 is simply an emergency clause to make this take effect upon it becoming law. With that, Mr. Speaker, that's what Senate Bill 8 does. So I would move for the passage or final passage of Senate Bill 8. 